Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Flamingo Sundays podcast, sitting here in beautiful Newcastle. It's a Thursday afternoon and I'm joined by a Newcastle great, actually a global great, pro surfer, business owner, Julian Wilson. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks Jack. <laughs> Appreciate you having me on. I am a, I guess, somewhat adopted Nova Castro <laughs> for, for four and a half years in. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's thanks for having me on. Mate, thanks for coming on. Mate, there's a lot to cover off and I think a good place to, to start is... is, is just what you were saying then, Novocastrian or, or an adopted Novocastrian, where uh, where did life begin? Where did you grow up? Yeah, I grew up uh, in Coolum Beach on the Sunshine Coast. Um, yeah, two older brothers, mum, dad, everyone surfed, grew up at the beach. was lucky enough to have that lifestyle. Um, and yeah, I uh, yeah, grew up on the Sunshine Coast and married a Novocastrian girl and We've since had two kids and um, very shortly after our first child was born, we we moved quickly down to Newcastle <laughs> um, to be by sort of my wife's family side and, and have that support and, and I travel so much that that was uh, a no-brainer. Yeah, that would have been an interesting conversation, right? Two very, very good parts of Australia, Sunshine Coast and, and Newcastle. How, how did the conversation go down? Uh, exactly. Uh, yeah, um, I've I've done. I've landed on my feet again for sure. Coming to Newcastle, so much on, to offer here. Yeah. Um, it's just a bit bigger, a bit busier, um, but also a lot more to offer. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, my wife having our first child, and uh, and to be honest, like going through that experience of uh, being there with her and and having our first child, and then. It was like, whatever my wife wanted to do, I just said, yep, whatever it is, I'm here for you. Like, it's a it's a pretty, uh, you know, surreal experience and, like, women are extremely strong and I, I don't think you you really appreciate their strength until uh, you experience something like that. A lot of people say that. I haven't experienced it myself yet, so I've, yeah. I've, got, I've got a bit to go, but yeah. they say happy wife, happy life, so... Yeah, for sure. There's there's a out. balance, and yeah, I'm I'm happy to live in Newcastle. I, my wife has has her sister who has three kids, and um, yeah, her parents are just around the corner. They help out a lot with the kids. Uh, we're close to the beach in Merriweather. The waves are there's a, there's a lot more waves here than on the Sunshine Coast. Really, the swell is uh, yeah a lot more consistent here. Um, so I'm not complaining and. I love mountain biking in Glen Rock and I ride dirt bikes and play golf. I'm a member at Newcastle Golf Club, so I'm, Got everything uh, you I'm need. pretty happy here too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not bad. So, mate, let's unpack the childhood. Like, you know, becoming a professional athlete, professional sports person or, you know, whatever the term is that, you know, people use, I think for the majority of kids is like the panacea, right? Before you know what you want to do as a career, most people want to be a professional in whatever sport they are growing up. Um, and, and you obviously, you know, hit that level and, and, and I've had a very, very successful career in doing so. How, yeah. how did it unfold from, from going from essentially just something you did for fun to then something that you, you said, let's really give this a crack and make a, a career and a life out of it? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to unpack in to sort of explain how it came about. Um, but I guess to make it make it pretty short and... And for it to make sense, um, I was the youngest of three boys. My mum and dad both surfed. Um, basically, I started surfing when I was three, three and a half years of age, um, straight into the water. It was just sort of a no-brainer. Um, I was born at the beach, basically. And, um, yeah, I just followed my brothers, followed mum and dad. Um, but... We grew up surfing a place called Noosa Heads, which is extremely family friendly. It's mm. an easy wave. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's a nice introduction to surfing and you can get started at that age. I definitely wouldn't suggest doing that down at Merriweather or somewhere where it's extremely dumpy um, down here. But um, yeah, I was able to get a really early introduction into, into surfing and uh, into, you know, through my family and 
my brothers quickly became professional surfers, uh, riding longboards actually, and my family, we were all longboarders. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, and we were part of the Noosa Longboarding Club, and that was our, you know, once one Sunday every month we'd do, we'd do that competition, and um, yeah, my introduction was through longboarding to surfing, and um, I guess it, I grew up riding BMX, I grew up riding dirt bikes, skateboarding, um, they were the things that I did after school, and I never grew up like most professional surfers um, as kids, like getting their surfs in before school, and mm. um, just kind of never went that way. Um, throughout my childhood it was always there was never any pressure to go surfing um my older brothers didn't necessarily surf before school or there was there was sort of enough of an age gap between the one in the middle was five years and seven years to my eldest brother I kind of always had to go pretty hard to get into the friend their friend circle in any way any sort of invite so I think that started my competitiveness and and my I guess desire to always kind of push harder than my friends would or it was just always about trying to get into that kind of friend circle that my brothers were in and and maybe get to those type of waves and those environments that they were playing in. Um, I guess I was always pushing myself without knowing. Um, But... Yeah, it was just, my my parents were extremely supportive. My dad, he laid tiles from, he was a labourer, he laid tiles from when he was 16 till he was 64. Um, Mum was a stay-at-home mum. Financially, it was just, you know, week by week sort of thing, like never were in a great financial situation, Mm -hmm. Um, but was never shown or sort of told to us as as the boys growing up um and yeah so mum sort of drove us around in a van and got us to the beach and whatever fun we wanted to get into my brothers were great cricketers my middle brother was Queensland emerging players as like an opening batsman and then Australian longboarding champion so um it was I guess yeah we were making the most of it and my mum was putting in a lot of time and dad was working his butt off to to allow us to have that lifestyle growing up um and yeah that was kind of how it was our weekends were full of going to the beach and or going to the cricket um i was by the time i came along (laughs) to like start playing cricket i think i got like two years of playing cricket in the under under 12s and then by the end of the second year, my brothers were kind of over it. They were getting to the age where they just wanted to surf and they were sponsored to surf. And so then it was all right, we dropped the cricket. So then it was just, yeah, weekends were at the beach after that. Um, <laughs> Sounds like sport was uh, was the common thing. Sport was the common thing, yeah. And the Sunshine Coast had access to that in a really effortless way. Um, didn't have to go far to the you know to to get stuck into whatever you were into Mm. um and so that was yeah really fortunate growing up on the sunshine coast um and then yeah that was kind of my childhood was just yeah dad worked really hard um kind of would see him on the weekends and then mum was getting us around um doing everything that mothers do, especially a stay-at-home mum. And just trying to keep up with the brothers. Just Yeah, and I was just trying to keep up with the brothers and, um, yeah, I guess was always pushing myself without knowing how hard I think I was pushing myself to keep up. And, um, yeah, I I guess I had that burning sort of desire to to try and get to their level from a very young age without knowing. And then for me... The shortboarding thing was always a part of my, always a part of my life, but it was just fun as as well as longboarding was. And competitive longboarding was like just a family affair. It was like you share share waves. You don't hassle. You don't. It's not competitive. It's like kind of who's having the best time is yeah, sort right. of winning on the day. And 
that's just how that longboarding mentality um, was and it was a great family lifestyle. Um, and the shortboarding was always kind of fun but super competitive. Um, sponsorship started like really young in the shortboarding. Money started a lot younger. Pressure started a lot younger. Um, I loved skating, riding bikes. Like it was kind of like um, if you were just shortboarding and you were getting support, you were probably getting paid by the time you were 12. Um, you were probably dropping your skateboarding and dropping those other hobbies that you had just because there was already some sort of pressure on mm. you to perform and from the sponsors potential and, yeah, yeah. yeah that the sponsors would have seen in you um so i kind of got to like slip through the cracks on that one and um it wasn't really until i was 15 i remember super clearly uh, my two elder brothers were competing on like the world longboarding tour um it was called the Oxbow World Longboarding Tour and they were doing really well and they were top five um, on that tour and there was, financially it was a pretty good career at the time, professional longboarding. Um, and then it just, basically, they just ran out of funds and they just didn't have it set up right and it just disappeared and the World Longboarding Tour fell apart. I was 15 um yeah 14 15 my older brother was like 19 20 um and they all of a sudden just went from like competing on a world tour and getting paid to like uh, my middle brother went to california to sell the longboards for his shaper that he was sponsored by so he had this dodge ram van that he was driving <laughs> Like the west coast of california selling these long boards just so he could surf and and keep doing what he loved doing and then the other brother went um and start and started doing quality control in china for uh the epoxy surfboard uh surfboards that, that his shaper was manufacturing in china so they kind of like dream just sort of went up in smoke like overnight yeah, um from some things outside of their control essentially yeah exactly yeah. and just yeah the money wasn't there um it just disappeared and it uh there was no there was no future in competitive longboarding at the time especially any sort of financial support so it turned around and they started working for their for their surfboard shaper at the time um i remember i was yeah 14 15 and I was just like, oh, damn, like the dream of like following in my brother's footsteps just is, is over. And like I was pretty quite young, but it was super clear and evident to me that like longboarding wasn't going to provide a career path for me to like turn around and, and say thank you to mum and dad for what they put into me. And like, I guess I already knew I had a skill set that was pretty good as a surfer mm. and i was i was you doing sponsored at this point yeah i was yeah. sponsored at this point i was sponsored by quicksilver um Just a few small brands <laughs> yeah which is yeah big big surf brand um and they sponsored me yeah mostly for for shortboarding um but also knowing that i wasn't like super competitive shortboarder but I had an ability to, like, I was good enough that I could, I got invited to, like, be a part of a Quicksilver surfing film that was being made with Kelly Slater and um, guys like that at that age. Um, and which was kind of the first time it was like, oh, I've, you know, this is sort of, like, way bigger than I ever expected what's happening now. Were those, were those guys guys that you aspired to be like growing up or like, you know, had as posters yeah. on the wall and all the rest of it or? Yeah, it's a funny one for me. Like, I guess growing up in the environment that I grew up in, it, it wasn't about like, I didn't have the Kelly Slater poster on my wall or the Andy Irons. Um, I had like longboarders as posters on my wall and I had Matt Hayden as 
poster on my wall for cricket and and BMX posters and like that was just yeah like I I wasn't I didn't grow up in a shortboard family and I didn't grow up thinking I was going to be Kelly Slater or um, the next like great shortboarder in any way but that's fascinating from someone like I don't have a surfing background I've only come to surfing since I've moved to Newcastle and I understand it in more detail now but the fact that essentially the same community right everyone surfs but it sounds like longboarding and shortboarding are two different communities inside of a an overarching community yeah they're worlds apart honestly um longboarding is just for the love of it especially now like this the financial support in longboarding isn't doesn't provide there's maybe five people in the world that would maybe make enough money to not have to work weekdays like yeah, I don't know well. like it's yeah it's, it's just but I I don't I don't really understand how it's not more marketable and how there isn't more opportunity there for people to make good money in longboarding um, I guess the competition side of it is the platform's not there which is a big part of why the financial support's there not there I think um, but yeah like Everywhere you go, there's a longboarding community, but it, it's kind of like it's a family community and it's not, it's kind of not that cool to be competitive. Mm. And I think that's why there isn't like a great competitive platform for longboarding. So if, if you're out there, if you're out there like cutting people off and yeah. <laughs> slamming them, it's not, a, it's not a cool thing. It's just not going to, it's just not happening, especially because on a longboard, like you could basically catch any wave you want. Mm. You kind of have probably. S- five times the ability to catch a wave than on a short board just by like paddle advantage so right. you can be sitting 15 meters further out the back and pick whichever wave you want that comes and <laughs> stroke into it and be into it early and just clear everyone out of the way it's just but that's i guess that's where that respect and that family sort of environment happens is that it, you could be extremely selfish on a longboard and you could take every single wave that comes through just about, but it is a matter of like respect and like sharing and like really beautiful messages come from the longboarding community. And I've always held those um, really highly as I've navigated the shortboarding career that I've had. And um, man, it's so cutthroat. And like, I think it's really hard for like somebody that grew up wanting to be a Kelly Slater or just a shortboarding dream, I don't think they ever really get an opportunity to, to see it from, I guess, from a view of like a longboarder would see going and surfing, mm. where it's not all about the competition. It's not about like the best and like it's not about getting that step up on every everyone around you. It's like it's sharing and caring and being stoked for other people, which like... Is how life yeah. should be, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's, it's, it's not a way of, uh, you know, making um, a great career, financial career and um, competitive career. It's, it's not there, and I guess that's why. Um, but I feel super appreciative for, for having that upbringing, and I still, com- I still ride longboards today. I've got a few longboards, and I always have had longboards, and I just – yeah, like it's so easy to go and have a really enjoyable time in the surf on a longboard for me. Mate, it's awesome. So with, uh, with coming up, 15, 16, you're sponsored. Sounds like you're more into shortboarding than longboarding. Yeah. When, when did you, you know, then go, well, most people when you get into, what, 15, 16, 17, you're starting to think about first jobs or what you're going to do when you finish school. Had you committed then to know that this is the career? I don't have to worry about getting an apprenticeship or, you know, going mm. to get a job as, you know, with dad or something like that. Like, you know, surfing was the, was the thing. Uh, it was never a certainty. I think definitely when I was around that time that my, I, I watched my brothers sort of their dream sort of vanish overnight um, and watch them turn into, you know, just starting to work for, for their money to just to keep surfing um, and not get paid just to go surfing um that was the point where i went okay like 
I'm going to go the shortboarding route. It's not comf- not that comfortable for me. I don't like that super competitive environment. And I grew up on the Sunshine Coast and the Gold Coast was like the shortboarding mecca. It was where like the best of the best were from. It was like the most competitive environment, probably on the East Coast of Australia or if not in Australia, they had yeah, the right. biggest event every year. Like they had the, the best surfers in Australia were coming out of there but I lived two and a half hours up the road and I was always kind of like, oh, we're on the Goldie, like shit, like who, you know, like you, you, you get out there in the surf and it's just, it's competitive from, from the car park to trying to catch a wave. Um, but yeah, at that age I went, okay, like I'm not going to make a career out of longboarding. I do have to walk this road of like getting into a very uncomfortable space. I've got to, you know, put the time in, I'm, I'm going to focus on the shortboarding side. I think there's, I've got the ability to, to match it with these guys, beat these guys, like make a career for myself, provide for my family, give back to my family. That was a sh- huge motivational part for me. Fly the flag, I felt like a lot for just even my two older bro- brothers that I watched their, their dream sort of like just disappear and I just I felt that I guess as a younger brother and always looking up to them and always trying to get to their level um so yeah there was a real shift there I already had great support and sponsorship from Quicksilver I've been sponsored since I was nine years of age (laughs) I I was sort of a token sponsorship at that time because my two old brothers were really good surfers and like thoroughly deserved to be sponsored and I we just, as a family, went to one of the. It, this was uh, this brand was called O'Neill. Um, I remember O'Neill. Yeah, yeah. and is this still around? O'Neill's still around and still a really strong surf brand. Um, and yeah, I was just sort of the token brother that came along um, to the photo shoot at Byron, and I was nine. And yeah, from from that. You know, they just saw me surfing and were like, all right, we'll just take on the whole family. So, like, yeah, I've been sponsored since I was nine. Um, But, yeah, when I was 15 and sponsored by Quicksilver and already starting to get some great opportunities and surfing with some of the best shortboarders in the world, it was just, yeah, it was time for me to, like, really focus on the shortboarding side of my surfing and... Mm and um try and make a life and career out of surfing because i was like you know i just knew how special it was to like if you could create a career at the beach that was by going to the beach and playing in the ocean that was like the pinnacle that was Mm -hmm. the ultimate i did dabble in a lot of other things and i loved loved to uh, plenty of other hobbies as a kid growing up but like there was nothing more satisfying than going in the ocean and you know always from a very young age appreciated that every time you go to the beach it's a different completely different playing field so like it doesn't matter if you've got it dialed and wired in one type of conditions like you go the next day it's completely different you never go into the same court or same field like Mm. it's every day is different which is probably one of the coolest parts about surfing and trying to consistently competitively surf at your best and like beat the best um in an ever-changing like playing field that's Mm. sort of i always felt like probably one of the most appealing parts of of uh of competing and and doing what i've done for for a long time now um but yeah there was no certainty at that age that I was going to like financially have a good career or like it was going to be worth it. It was just like, I just knew that, that, that w- what went from like probably 60% of my time was like longboarding and 40% was shortboarding at that time in my life. It was just like, I think my longboard just went and sat in the shed and never came out for like probably, yeah, I think I did my last longboarding competition when I was, that year, like 15, turning 16 at Crescent Head, we come to Crescent Head. Crescent um, Head, it's a good place. Yeah, it was like the funnest longboarding event. It was our favourite holiday every year to come to Crescent. Um, 
and that was it. Yeah, for Longboard. And that, you come down from the sunny coast to Crescent? Yeah, we drive down, and <laughs> that was like our biggest, yeah, our biggest trip, and the one we look forward to the most. Crescent's a great spot, um, and yeah, Longboard just went, put that aside, and then I just, yeah, focused on the shortboarding. I went to the Gold Coast a lot, um, started competing a lot more. I was competing against like the best international juniors from from yeah around the world coming especially to the Gold Coast and Lennox Head um, to compete so I got a chance to see where the level was at and it was extremely high and it was overwhelming and it was like they were just into me and it was all cutthroat and like from that age and um, yeah I just took it on and and um, just accepted the challenge and that's sort of where my shortboarding career really became something that I was like all right I'm going to be a shortboarder I'm going to like have an opportunity to give back to the upbringing that I've had and continuing to have at that age um, it's a no-brainer and I'm going to make it work and I'm going to like I guess show sort of my brothers that like everything that they were teaching me and pushing me to do was going to be worth it in some way I think I always felt that way um and then that kind of you know that actually ended up turning into a an incredible opportunity where like my first yeah, as, as the shortboarding stuff really kicked off and, um, like, I won, like, World Juniors, uh, I think I was 16 over in Brazil. Wow. Um, and just, yeah, the shortboarding stuff was really, like, there were signs there that was that was telling me that I had, obviously, the potential to, like, to do well and make it make a life out of it um and yeah probably yeah winning world juniors when i was 16 and then i got a wild card from quicksilver to do the big world tour event on the gold coast and um i was yeah 16 and i had my first heat was against kelly slater and another guy named danny wills and um, what was the pressure like like it's obviously they're known as some of the best in the world or the best in the world uh yeah <laughs> he was by far the best in the world and danny wills was sort of he was the best australian um at that time um and although it was two and a half hours away from my hometown it felt like the home crowd was there um so i didn't really feel like pressure but i felt like an incredible opportunity to like I needed to take advantage of mm. um, and I was able to do that I was able to beat Kelly and Danny in the first heat and that was like a huge like I remember really clearly like after that that heat I was standing on the beach and my family was there and there was just like a real clear moment like okay like I think I'm gonna make a career out of this like this is this is a legit thing. If I can beat the best in the world, I, I must be doing best, something right. If I can beat the best in the world, like this is 100% what I'm going to do and I think I can make a career out of it. Um, so that was a real, like, I guess, pillar in my career that was just, yeah, I knew I was heading in the right direction. Um, and, yeah, no, it's it's been good. But, yeah, just, yeah, it's, a, it's not the most common, um, I guess, like story of of how it came about and where the motivation and drive came from i think it just it really came from just having an incredible upbringing and and wanting to give back and say thanks to my family my parents for giving me the opportunity and also my brothers for pushing me without really knowing they were pushing me um yeah it's just so it sounds like family for you is a big driver that's your why definitely it is 100 percent and and as my career went on, it always stemmed from that. Mm. Like, it was always it. And then fast forward, travelling the world for how many years? Nine years? Ten years? Oh, I've been travelling the world. Um, 
I've been traveling the world for like 24 was, years. I was, was half, half of that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, since I was, since I was nine, O'Neill sent me to Switzerland. Um, shortly after they picked me up with a sponsorship to do like their winter uh, catalog in Switzerland. Um, so yeah, I've been traveling, yeah, internationally since I was nine. So big, big career, and I'm sure there's been yeah. like you know massive ups and and probably some some downs as well. Like I think for the majority of people who look at professional sports people, like like I said, it's probably the panacea. They probably think it's all daisy and 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 you know rainbows and skittles like yeah. what, what's some of the the, the tough stuff that pro- most people probably wouldn't see when um, they're looking from the outside looking in um i mean majority of it is pretty tough um i think you have to have an incredible support network to make it work and give yourself an opportunity to be to be at the top level uh, in the first place um i mean you just to try and qualify for the top 36 surfers in the world, which is the world tour, which is where you can then compete for a world title. And it's like the pinnacle of our sport. You start out by traveling internationally, um, to all over the world. Um, and the way that the competitions work when you are traveling to try and collect points to then qualify for the world tour, like you fly to Spain, um, you can rock up, waves can be knee high, you got three other guys in your heat, there's no waiting period, you're just thrown out there, you lose first heat, you're on a plane the next week, you've got no points, made no prize money, you're flying to Brazil for the next event. Like, And for majority of us, like if you're like at that stage where you're just trying to qualify for the tour, you're doing it on your own. So like... <laughs> you're spending nobody does it in a way that it just kind of breezes through and you're Mm. making prize money it's like you know you're you're spending a lot of time on your own but like it's making sense because you're getting points you're like working towards it everybody's had those moments where you're flying from spain to brazil with no points no prize money you're out of pocket 10 grand like thinking what am i doing like you know, am I kidding myself thinking I'm going to have a career out of com- competitive um, surfing? Like, it's a hard slog and you go straight into it from 18 years of age, like, or 17. Like, you're traveling the world on your own. You hopefully got a mate or two that's on the same sort of program you are. Um, but, yeah, you're – and you're traveling for – I mean, you're competing for 10 months of the year to try and qualify for the world tour and you're like every month you're in another country and you like the prize money is not that great, but the world tour is great. But to get there, it's, it's a tough road. Um, and yeah, you're not traveling with a team. You don't have, you know, mm. support network. You got home, but it's a long way away. Um, yeah, that, that stuff, I guess you grow up extremely quick. Um, you got a lot of time to think about things on planes and like just, yeah, trying to rent cars and some countries it's fine, some it's not, like accommodation, like even when I first started traveling, doing the QS, like you didn't have like an iPhone with maps and <laughs> like, you know, you were like, you had to really plan ahead and um, yeah, man, it's just like... There's got to be so much just burning desire and will to like get there mm. and like doesn't matter what knocks you take, like there's only one way you're going because as soon as you let it creep in that, oh, maybe I'll go home and like, you know, study and go to uni and like, you know, maybe realistically that's the best thing for me to do or go home and start laying tiles like that's what my life's going to be there's you know it's so easy to get walk down that road and do a lot of people walk down that road a lot of people do um for sure and it totally is like you know you, you can understand it um and like some guys are trying to do the qualifying tour and they don't even have sponsorship so they're taking loans out and they're borrowing mm. money and there's, you know, no guarantees. It's just a dream that they're chasing. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, yeah, like post COVID, it's probably that the guys doing the qualifying tour would be in the toughest position. They've, it'd be the hardest time I think ever to, to be doing it, to travel international, uh, internationally, the price of flights, accommodation, rental cars, then prize money is 20% less than it was pre COVID, um, across the board for competitive shortboarding. Like it's a tough time, mm. I think for, for, um, somebody trying to crack it and, and get on the world tour. Um, but yeah, it's not all rosy. Um, obviously when you get there and you get those, those highlight moments, um, and, and you get to do the world tour and, and it's obviously like, it's an incredible life and it's worth working extremely hard for to get there and experience. And I had the pleasure of being there for 10 years and, um, it's, yeah, I made it work and super appreciative of, of the career that I've had, um, at that top level. Um, but yeah, it's a grind. It's, it's international travel from a really young age on your own, navigating the world, taking your losses, you know, you're not very rarely as uh, these guys got coaches or like, you know, team support or anything around them. It's just like hop on a plane, fly 12 hours to the next event. You might be, yeah, jet lag, you surf the next day, you got super tricky conditions it's not equal opportunity it's yeah you got you got a lot to deal with um to to crack it to to make it to the world tour in in surfing absolutely um and it's yeah it's a um it's a grind. very very yeah. small percentage that makes that just yeah makes the world tour 36 um, you said yeah 36 yeah yeah globally globally yeah <laughs> crazy yeah so like for for yourself before we jump jump on to, to what's next like obviously mindset sounds like it's probably the most important thing right because when you lose a heat or you, you lose an event or doesn't something doesn't go to plan and you've got those doubts in your mind like fuck should i be doing this or you know, should i just go home and get a job and hang out with me mates like what are some of the things that that you i guess dealt with or how did you deal with those doubts because i think everyone you know has them at some point in their life mm -hmm. and it, you know being able to deal with them i i feel like from all the people i've interviewed is probably the thing that separates the people that make it and the people who you know go back to living a normal everyday yeah. life yeah for sure i think um it was really hard to like a net i hated losing more than anything um and you don't seem like a competitive person like yeah i don't know put me in i guess in an environment where there's something that I really, really want or something that I think is going to benefit people around me and things definitely change for <laughs> sure. Um, in a demon comes out. Yeah. I think just like, I think it's that silent competitor that I had that I didn't know I had that was there um, when I was trying to catch up to my brothers from, you know, just growing up and wanting to be accepted. Um, yeah it just it just happened i guess it, it um just festered in me and i didn't really know it was happening and then i <laughs> ended up ended up um yeah chasing the top of the you know chasing world titles and that sort of stuff um but yeah when i when i started and when i was trying to qualify for the tour and there was just there was no way that i was going home and accepting like that it wasn't going to happen. It was like, I wasn't going to go back to mum and dad and my brothers and be like, yeah, like maybe I could have, but like, it's really hard out there, like traveling the world, like, you know, trying to, trying to make the tour and like take your losses. And like, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not, it's just not comfortable. Like I, I can't like play in that space and, and like, you know, be a winner. And, and make it happen like I'm just going to come home I'm just going to yeah settle back in and I got my friends here and it's comfortable it was just that wasn't an option for me I couldn't go home and just like there was no way I was going to go home and face the music of like yeah like my childhood was amazing and everything you did for me was great but it's too hard like that just 
wasn't an option and that was like my my number one motivator and like going from event to event was always like as soon as I thought about how nice it would be to go home and hang out with my friends and like be there for the stuff that you're normally there for growing up like part and yeah parties graduations just school like mm. you know um I just wouldn't let it wouldn't let it exist I was like no nah, I'd like I've there's so much that's been kind of put into getting me to this opportunity like there's no way that I'm walking away from it and I know I can do it and like it's not going to be easy but like I can do it at the end of the day and I'm going to find a way to do it so it's like once you committed that was it was no just burn the bridges yeah I think I also felt that like I was lucky enough to have like great sponsorship at that time Mm. so I felt like and I'd also had some incredible like moments in my career already that showed that I could be the best in the world at my age or could beat the very best of all time at Mm. that age so there was like there was things that was like that showed me that it was gonna work out I was gonna find a way to make it make it work because you had people that had confidence in you right it was reinforcing had the support had the opportunity to compete against the best um, was able to beat them like there was just enough there and I had an incredible support network from like my family and they were you know obviously believed in me 100% um, which helped a lot Um, but yeah mate and then COVID hits 10 years on the tour and you think maybe it's uh, maybe it's time to spend a little bit more time with the with the family and step back from surfing uh yeah i've i've not stepped back from surfing i've stepped back from the world tour i gave up my spot last year um covid hit and uh yeah in right around the time that my second child was born um and i had already traveled with my first child um for two years with my wife and she olivia my daughter she'd done yeah two laps around the world with us and following i guess my dream of of what i was doing um and we had all plans to do that with the second and um and then COVID, yeah obviously really really changed how that looked and the surfing tour got put on hold um there was no certainty on how it was going to look post COVID, during COVID, when things were going to change when the tour could kick off Uh, with all the restrictions and um yeah it was just sort of got put into a into a holding pattern um and then from that point the tour um i guess they've just been trying to make it work inside of the pandemic and it ended up looking a hell of a lot different um by the end of 2020 um the it was the tour had come to the surfers and said okay we're going to kick the tour off um in january in hawaii um of 2021 and we're going to do two events in hawaii one in Cal- northern california uh it's going to be three and a half months um can't travel with family um you can have one support member um and I guess that was like the first, <clears throat> the first moment where I went, wow, like this is really, really different. Like I had incredible support from my wife um, throughout my career. Um, she traveled a lot with me to the events. Um, and it was always about that sort of bigger picture for me, like the purpose and the travel and the experience and like, you know, kind of combining my personal life and competitive life Mm. and the opportunity was always there we go to events for two week periods in beautiful locations and it just made a lot of sense to like travel with your families and there was guys on tour traveling with three kids and um they you know were winning world titles it completely made sense um so it was an incredible lifestyle but yeah the landscape got flipped upside down um 
I went to Hawaii. Uh, that was had to go over in December to compete. Started January, um, and that was sort of yeah, it's kind of where my focus and purpose really started to get really like blurry and and difficult to understand. Um, obviously, like Christmas solo in Hawaii, both with, my kids' with birthday, two kids. yeah, wow, like. Just everything actually fell in those few months. Um, And then, yeah, the tour just sort of kept trying to find a way to operate through the pandemic. Um, And I was, yeah, I um, was there and like, I was at the mercy of whatever um, decisions they were making and how they could do it and completely understanding of, of how difficult it was to run an international, um, sporting calendar, um, through the pandemic, like, especially when that travels around the globe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, it just changed a lot and found myself I had six weeks in hotel quarantine in Sydney, coming back from these events. I was exposed to like incredible amounts of COVID overseas. And if I caught COVID, I was in two weeks isolation, unable to compete. There was, it was just a really extremely uncomfortable environment to be trying to compete and selflessly like see myself, like give myself a, I don't know, like, try and understand why I was doing it and like Mm. yeah it was just really difficult for me to see that um and I was also qualified for the Olympics and the Olympics got pushed back a year and then went ahead um and it was just yeah around the time of um the Olympics was coming up there was another three month um travel period coming up where it went to Tokyo for the Olympics, went on to uh, Mexico, on to Tahiti, and then on to another two-week hotel quarantine. It was like another three-month window. I'd already spent four months away from a young family, wife, all the COVID restrictions that were happening back here in Newcastle, my wife not even being able to get family support from around the corner at times because it was like lockdown. Um, And me just being overseas, I guess, chasing my dream, but at the same time, having the responsibility of being a husband, being a dad, um, and that meant, you know, just so much more to me. And um, yeah, it just led to a decision. I I was looking at that three and a half months, and the the opportunity of going to the Olympics and being the first Australian, um, one of only the first two male Australians to compete at the Olympics for surfing. Um, and there was two girls as well, obviously, but I felt like that was like an incredible moment that I had to be a part of. Um, but after that, the world tour itself, I needed to take a break from. Mm. Um, and that's when I decided that I was stepping away from the tour. Uh, and I did that. I did the Olympics. I came home. I didn't continue on the tour. I didn't go to Mexico or Tahiti. Tahiti ended up getting cancelled because of COVID. Um, and yeah, I just sat in hotel quarantine and um, was uh, yeah the the I guess the life that I knew extremely well and and was very dedicated to that that competitive life that I was living. I was definitely saying goodbye to that not permanently but indefinitely mm. like it was um it was a tough one and then you sit in a hotel room for two weeks on your own just going wow like i i really did that i'm, I'm really doing this but um it also was like the biggest weight off my shoulders i think i i could have could have had it was a really tough year to to um to try and make the sacrifice for and obviously i kind of i gave in and i I haven't haven't looked back um but yeah I'm definitely in a new chapter in my in my career now um and just home a lot more and get to sort of control my travel calendar for once (laughs) in my life and um I think the overarching thing for that again was that family piece right like you were doing everything growing up for for mum and dad and the brothers and 
you made the decision year before last for uh, for the family that you uh, now created. Uh, the yeah, big driver. Exactly. Yeah, family is kind of gives me, I guess, all my purpose for whatever it is that I'm working for. Definitely. And, it, and it's uh, the name was born out of the two kids, Revia. Yeah. 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 yeah so I've started a new brand. Yeah, started my my own brand. Um, it's a men's surf. Uh, active wear brand um, that's influenced and inspired by my hobbies um, which is mountain biking and and golfing and uh, skateboarding and um, yeah the name is uh, a combination of my kids Um, and that actually came about during the pandemic when I was having those large periods of time away from the family I was I was um, drawing uh, Rivia on the bottom of my boards because it was a combination of my kids' names. Um, <laughs> just because I missed them and I wanted a, something, it was just I guess it was just a tough time. Um, and then yeah, that that just kind of the opportunity to start my own brand came about um, during that year uh, around the time of the Olympics. Um, and yeah, very naturally sort of carried over that that name. It's the combination of my kids. I've got a river and I've got an Olivia. Uh, he gets Riv and she gets Via. So it's Rivia. Um, and then it's called Rivia Projects. Projects is because um, like excited for, for building projects um, with Rivia. I already have a kids event that I have on the Sunshine Coast um, of yeah, which is which has already been really successful with support of other sponsors in the past, and one that I'll continue now to do as you know a Revia Projects event, which is going to be something that I'll be really passionate about. Um, and yeah, I've just you know I I'm definitely thankful that I'm not trying to do the tour and build a brand for the first time. Um, it requires a lot of time. Um, which I've been really enjoying and it's given me a great focus away from competitive surfing. Um, and yeah, obviously the purpose is there and um, it's, it's a bit of a yeah, family affair. What's, what's the goal for Revia? Like, did you, when, you, when you started to build the brand, did you set out, you know, I want to build it for X reason or this is what I want to you know, turn it into or was it just more of a passion project that's um, grown? For me, I've had incredible support from great brands um, throughout my career, and from yeah, when I was nine, I've I've had support um, and represented brands. And there's been moments in my career, especially in the last ten years when I was on the world tour, where I, the thought has crossed my mind. Definitely, um, I always like my favorite brands were always sort of skateboarding brands and like you know, more urban street style brands, but I'd um, sort of like to see at the beach as well. Mm -hmm. And skateboarding was always a big inspiration for me. Um, And I, yeah, I just always sort of had that um, inkling of like, you know, how cool it would be if, if surf kind of took a little more from skate, which, you know, there is so many crossovers that happen there um, and influences on surfing styles and um, the way people, um, yeah, like surf and you're, you're and dress. Well known for aerials, are you not? That's just essentially yeah. a skating thing, right? When you air out the bowl. Yeah, definitely. I think um, I was yeah one of one of the first sort. Of, there was sort of a generational shift that happened when I got on tour where aerials became almost it had to be a part of your repertoire to get extra, <laughs> really high scores and my my aerial surfing definitely has come from growing up skateboarding definitely um just not being connected to the board um obviously a skateboard's a lot smaller than a surfboard consequences are way higher on a skateboard as you know landing on concrete as opposed to landing in the water so it was easy for me to build a lot of confidence to go for big big airs and 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 go for that side of things um 
from growing up skateboarding, I think, definitely. Mm. And, and that's, that is why I've always sort of been inspired by skateboarding and, um, yeah, just the, their, their style and culture. I, I really like it. That's dope. And, and is, is the goal now to, you know, I guess, roll it out through surf community, start to make it the uh, Revere World Tour instead of the Quicksilver World Tour? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, the opportunity, I mean, that's, that's a massive part of it to have an opportunity one day to support other surfers and mm. surfers that I really appreciate the way they surf. And, um, like that's definitely a very exciting piece of it that if I work hard enough and create something big enough, I can turn around and support surfers, support events, you know, like the opportunities that I think I could create would be a little bit more in line with sort of, I guess my, my upbringing and like, yeah, skating and, and having that side of things um, where it's, it's not as competitive. I mean, at, at a young age, especially to influence young kids, it doesn't matter if you've got a great sponsorship, like, you know, it's important to still skate if you love skating and, and understand that that influences how you surf and mm. influences how you you grow up and um, it's important to keep those aspects in your life. They can totally coexist with a great competitive um, surfing career. Um, that's definitely a goal with the brand is is letting, wanting kids to, like, be kids and have and fun. Have fun and, um, and that's the yeah that's the name of the kids event that I have up up on the Sunshine Coast and I've got um, plans and to do one here in Newcastle as well um, to and it's called Serious Fun and um, yeah it's just, just I guess projecting the message of how I sort of grew up and and my upbringing and how it wasn't um, just you know, surfing before school, after school and cut and, you know, just sticking to a, you know, um, a kind of, yeah. Tight schedule. Tight regime and like mum and dad kind of, yeah, get your surf in, get your surf in, only, you know, do, do this, do that. But I love that. Keep the fun in it. Keep the fun in it. Before we, uh, before we wrap up, like, you know, you went from being, well, you still are a professional athlete, but you know now your main role is obviously now a business owner, growing a business, and a father and a, and a husband. Like, what 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 do you feel has changed now from being an athlete now to being a business owner and, and trying to grow a brand? And and how are you finding that transition? Um, I mean, the biggest thing for me now is, I guess, very humbly learning uh, a world that. I guess I was always able to take advantage of Mm. um, and that supported me um, to to chase uh, my competitive career Um, to to now dive into I guess the engine room on on how those brands exist and um, I love a challenge Um, it's a it's a it's been it's been a good uh, exciting learning experience. I think I, I have to, you know, I can influence how it looks and feels, but there's a lot of stuff that I'm learning that goes on, um, inside the brand that without this opportunity, I I wouldn't, I wouldn't be tapping into. And I think it's, um, it's a fu- it's a fun space for me to, to go into a room and and know you know not a whole lot <laughs> um, and and be humbled by that experience and learn from it and I'm not chasing um, competitive aspirations at the moment and I'm happy to be um, yeah I guess I'm obviously the face of the brand and and I'm working all aspects of the brand um, and yeah, I, I'm loving it. I, I love free surfing, creating content, filming. Um, I now have a whole new purpose to keep doing that stuff. Still traveling, um, still chasing good waves. 
yeah, providing exciting content and, and helping build the brand. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's a new chapter. It's, Do you look at the P&L every month and go, fuck, I've got to gotta up the game with the competitive nature comes in? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're like, everything's happened pretty quick. We're, mm. we're only 13 months on from first conversations. Um, wow. And we launched Digital Form uh, in February. Um, and by doing that and not providing um, a, a sale, like not uh, providing product, um, we were able to s get a feel for the interest of the brand. Um, and then... Was that with pre-orders and stuff like that? Yeah, so yeah. we went to retail and we had a... We, we had a um, <coughs> We had, a, uh, we had a full sample range. Um, we s sold into Australia, New Zealand, and the States we were, already, we were set up for. Um, got a good idea for the brand. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know if I'm supposed to be talking about that. That's <laughs> <laughs> all right. We'll, we'll, we'll cut it there. But essentially, yeah. you, 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 you grow, you're growing the brand. Sounds like it's yep. going well. Yeah. And yeah. uh, you've done it in a strategic way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, it's, and it's reflective of everything that you live for, your kids, your family, having fun with everything you do in life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the biggest thing with the brand is promoting like an active lifestyle where like it doesn't matter how serious your job is, like you got to let your hobbies exist inside mm -hmm. that world. Which I think um, a lot of people struggle with, especially in the business world, like business is their life and that's it. Yeah. And as you make more money and do better and it requires more of your time, it's easier to let go of those things that actually like need to exist in your life to feed, I guess, what gets you to that place you're at. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody, I think, myself included, is super guilty of letting those things go. Um, and this, is, this brand is about promoting that active discovery that message of like let those um, hobbies exist in your life we make a product for you to go out and feel comfortable doing it um, that's the message that we're promoting and and want to share and that's one that it has existed massively throughout my competitive career and i know that they can coexist um, and i think that's why i'm so passionate about um, revere projects and yeah I've, I, I think i've got something that i was always looking for as a com as a competitor um and also as like a a man with a lot of hobbies and <laughs> other interests that that influenced my career it's awesome dude thank you very much for coming on the show it was very very good thanks jack Cheers, no thanks for having me on